Today, what I want to talk about, the title of my message, I'm going to go straight into it, is who determines your identity? And the subtitle is, is it I or is it God? So I'm going to uh, rewind about 13 months ago, a little over a year ago, I found myself in a situation, okay, Um, Pastor Jamel talked about this on Sunday, about our twisted decision-making, okay? He went over Proverbs 14. uh, There is a path before a person that seems right but leads to death. I was in a situation because of twisted decision-making. And I had prayed to the Lord that if I was in a situation that was a result of twisted decision-making to get me out. And when he went to get me out, I said, wait a minute. (laughs) Wait a minute. (laughs) My flesh don't like this. Okay? But he did. So um, when you're in a situation and you want God to get you out of it, he's going to get you out of it even when your flesh don't want to get out of it. Okay? Okay? So, um, but the thing is, I kept finding myself in situation after situation. So I got saved in 2017, supernaturally delivered. Um, But in my walk with God, I was super on fire for the Lord and loved the Lord, but I kept getting in these situations. So I said, Lord, I don't want to just know Uh, I want to understand why I keep getting in these situations. Not only do I not want to keep getting in these situations, but I want to know why, okay? So I'm going to break it down to y'all tonight the way God broke it down for me, what he took me through, okay? So God says he doesn't put you in situations. That's what he told me. I don't put you in situations. You put yourself in them. But he will put you in a position, okay? So I looked up the definition of situation. It's a place where one finds itself, okay? A position is a place where one has been put. So what God showed me is when we're in a situation, how do we identify the difference between a situation and a position, right? Because I kept convincing myself that the situations I was in was a position I was in, but I kept needing to lean on the mercy of God, okay? So that's what the Lord told me. If you have to have an abundance of mercy, you're probably in a situation. You're probably in something that you put yourself in, okay? But if you're in a position, that's where his grace will flow with abundance. Amen? So I said, okay, God. So I started looking. I said, I want to know in the Bible if position, you know, is this a thing in the Bible? So I didn't study it deep because this would have went into a whole other word. But I found, I started looking up different articles, 49 different occurrences where people were positioned. Okay, that's just in one article that I found. So now I do want to say God doesn't let anything go to waste, right? We hear that all the time. So he will still use our situation. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his his purpose, right? But sometimes we mistake that for position. Amen? So here I was in this situation. It was one of those things, like Pastor Jamel said, it was twisted decision-making. I was in a situation, but I was convincing myself I was in a position. So I asked God, hey, if I'm in fact in a situation, get me out, and he gets me out, okay? So, but here I am, Lord, show me why. He said, it's because of where you find your identity. Now, I'm a practical person, okay? When I was growing up, my mom was a lesson teacher, okay? So if we did something wrong, she wasn't one who was going to whoop us or that was kind of, she was going to teach us a lesson. So I'm going to give you an example. I got caught stealing one time. I truthfully was not stealing. I was with somebody that was stealing, but because, look, you're guilty by association, 
So I get caught stealing, and instead of, you know, getting whooped, getting grounded like most parents do, my mom wanted to teach me a lesson. So I had to take every single dish out of the cupboard in the kitchen. And my mom had at least 300 Tupperwares, at least 500 pans. Like, we had a whole entire kitchen, okay? And I had to wash all these dishes by hand, reorganize. So teenagers, pay attention here, because y'all think you got it rough, okay? Then, so when you're a teenager, you know, you care more about what people think, right? So... I was kind of a cool kid growing up, and so I really cared about what people saw me do. Well, my mom decided to make me take leaves blowers and blow the leaves down our lane every day. I had to do this for a few weeks, okay? For me, that was humiliating. I'm like, my friends are going to see me do this. They're going to know I did something wrong, you know, but she wanted to teach us lessons, okay? Okay. So because of that, God has now taken that and is able to use that for me. God will show me things, practical situations. He'll give me spiritual revelation, okay? So I'm going to take you all through the process that he took me through with this. So I had to go through some repentance when I got out of this situation. I had to call even a couple of pastors here in this room and repent to them, you know, Y'all told me go this way or that way, and I didn't go this way or that way. And I positioned my heart because I wanted to stop getting in these situations. Okay? So second, I'm going to go into 2 Corinthians 5.17. It seems like I'm jumping all over, but this is all going to make sense. 2 Corinthians 5.17. I know we hear this scripture often. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So I come to Tulsa on an ultimatum. I'm on drugs, and my mom says, you can go to Bible college or you can go to rehab. You pick which one. But those are the ultimatum that you have to do in order to come here. I was living on the street, so I said, okay, I'm going to pick Bible college because then I can still be kind of rebellious but, you know, have some freedom. You know, So I pick Bible college. I'm not going to go into that whole story, but it took a year and a half after I came, went to Bible college, and before I finally surrendered to the Lord, I gave my life to the Lord. I was tired. I was exhausted. I was tired of running from him, from his will. Just I was a mess, and I give my life to him. I get baptized. I get filled with Holy Ghost. I get baptized, so but I'm broken. I'm busted. I don't trust people. Like literally, I could not allow church folk to get close to me. I was like, I want what they have, but I'm just never going to be able to be like they are. So I couldn't have people tell me, hey, you need to do this. Hey, you need to do that. Because I thought everybody was out to get me. Literally, I had extreme PTSD. I needed major deliverance. And so the Lord is the one who told me to get baptized. Okay. I'm like, I really don't want to go up in a horse trough on a stage. That's how the church I went to did it. I'm like, and get dunked and all of these things. But, okay, I'm going to go. So we had already had a plan as a family um, to get baptized in my mom's pool. The pastor was going to come over. We were going to have this whole little cool thing. Then it would be private. But God said, do it this way. So I think, so God tells me, I said, why do I need to get baptized? He said, because you need to die to your old self, okay? That's what the Lord told me, y'all. I said, okay, I could do that because I was not a good person. I said, I could die to my old self. I want rid of all that. And if if it takes going in a horse trough to do it, but here's the trick of it. When he told me this, because I was ignorant to the word, I was ignorant to the church, I was ignorant to how things work, I really thought I was going to physically die. I thought I was going to, y'all, when I'm telling this story because you have to see where God can take super crazy and make them normal. I was really crazy at the time, but I believed I was going to physically die. But I said, God, I'm willing because I don't want this life anyway, okay? So I went, I give my mom, my dog, I said, you know, she's like, she's, dealing with me on meth, all of these things. So she never knows what's coming. You know, she like, 
I'm like, I love you. She's thinking, you just get baptized, you know. I don't tell her I'm going to die because I'm like, she's going to freak out. She's not going to let me get baptized, you know. So I don't tell her I'm dying. I'm just like, I have to do it. I have to do it right now. I have to do it this Saturday. I'm doing it this Saturday. I know it needs to be done, okay. So I get up there. I get ba- and I'm like, goodbye, everyone. I get baptized, and I come back up out of the water. I'm like, wait, I'm still alive. I'm still alive. But literally in that moment, I knew that old person was dead. I knew that old person was dead. And I was so grateful that God let me still have life. So I said, okay, God, here we go. Show me whatever it is you want to show. Do what you want to do with me. Okay, but here's the thing. The old had died, but I didn't know who I was. Okay, I had been through delivered. I had, I had been through deliverance. I still had a lot to get delivered from. I had heard a lot of sermons. I felt a lot of freedom. But I didn't know who I was. And because I couldn't trust people, I didn't allow people in to tell me who I was. And I hated to read, and so I didn't read the word, okay? I didn't read the word, like hardly ever. When I read the word, I read it as a checklist. I would just checklist, checklist, thinking I earned brownie points with the Lord as I check off my list, okay? So I w- what I began to do is I began to start striving. I began to start finding my identity in ministry instead of in Jesus, And I began to start going from place to place to thing to thing to get the next thing to tell me who I was, how I was, all of the things, okay? I was busy, 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 sun up to sun down. And ministry, I want to make this clear, ministry is not bad. But the problem is that many of us do ministry as a Martha, and God wants us to do ministry as a Mary, okay? And I did not start to learn that until I came to this house. I'm going to be super unfiltered and transparent before y'all tonight because God told me to be, okay? So when I first came into this house, it was in the middle of while I was in this situation. And so the way I viewed the church was from a place of hurt. And so even though I knew God had me where I was supposed to be because I heard the voice of God and I still trusted that what God told me was right, I didn't want to be here. I didn't want to be here, and it wasn't because of anybody specifically here. I just didn't want to be in the church whatsoever. But I knew I needed to stay connected into the church. So when I first started, heard the pastors talk about rest. I was like, oh, so I'm amongst a bunch of lazy ministers. I used to be around a bunch of them that ran me crazy, and now I'm around a bunch of lazy ones. Okay, so because I could not rest. To me, resting was torture, and that's where I found my identity. So if I thought about resting, I was losing my value. I was losing my worth, amen, because that's where I found my value. That's where I found my identity. So if I had to hear that y'all rested and that it was God, then I was losing as a person, amen? So... Whew, Jesus. So I said, but it took a minute to get here. It took a minute to realize where this false identity came from. That's what I'm taking you through tonight because I believe that even though the false identity that I grasped was specific to me, I believe as I'm transparent before y'all, some of y'all may find that you have found your identity in things that are not of God as well and receive freedom tonight. So I said, God, I've been hurt by this person. I've been hurt by that person. This person's done wrong. This person, da 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 And I said, but I can't change none of that. I can't change any of that. But what I can do is allow you to create in me a clean heart. I said, so, God, I'm willing. I know it's not going to be easy. I know it's going to be tough, but I'm willing And that's where I called it. The first thing he said is repent to your leaders. And I called my leaders. Some of these leaders in here can testify. I called them up and I repented to them. And repentance is simply going in the other direction, right? 
going, stopping what you're doing and going in the other direction. But I had some repentance to do with my specific leaders too. So anyway, he said, give me a year, a year, and I want you to commit to your relationship with me. And I said, okay, we can do that. And he said, and I want you to focus on you. I said, well, now, wait, what about this ministry? What about where I serve here? What about that? What about my daughter? What about my family? What a- All the ministry stuff started running, and he stopped me. He said, I want you to commit to your relationship with me and focus on you. And in that, I said, in my 30, I was 37 at the time, in my 37 years of life, I don't think I've ever really genuinely put the focus on work on me. And it's hard for me. And by this time, I was trusting my leaders, so I was trusting when they were saying rest is good for you, that it was good. When they were saying it's good to focus on your health, that it was good, right? So I said, okay, God. So he gave me some different things. He said, start with your health. I had all the knowledge of good health. I was raised with a mother that's really into health, into nutrition. So I had all the knowledge, but I wasn't applying it. I wasn't applying it because I didn't see my worth in my identity. I saw it in everything else. I chased everything that gave me worth and let go of me, okay? And he told me, he started telling me, cut out distractions, Spend more places, spend more time in the places that I desire for you to be. Like, I thought I was. I thought everywhere, everywhere that I'm at is revolved around you, God. He says, no, you're just in places that look like me. I said, okay. He said, if the devil can't distract you with things that look like him, because he couldn't win win me with that anymore. When I tell y'all, I even... I went to the store. I went to fast food restaurants. I found heroin sitting on the ground. Like when I was on drugs, that never happened. I literally prayed to a God that I didn't think existed when I was dope sick because I wanted to find dope, and I could never find any. But once I was clean, I found it. Imagine that. But the devil, (laughs) the devil couldn't get me that way anymore. And so what he got me with was things that looked like God. And not that God wasn't in those places, but I had no business being in those places because all it would do is keep me busy, hung up, exhausted, and not knowing who I am, okay? And every minister that would disappoint me and every friend that would shame me and every person that would talk about me, it would tear down who I was because I didn't know who I was in the Lord. I just thought I just knew who I was in my works. So, the, so I'm at, and I hear me, when I tell you all these things tonight, God show me how to identify the false identity and how to start walking in my Christ-like identity. And when I tell you these things tonight, I don't come to you with shame. I tell you what he's had to clean me up from, okay? So I want to put that disclosure out there. It's literally things he's had to clean me up from. And I believe I'm still in my process, but a couple of weeks ago, I got a word from Bishop, and he said, God has had you in this place, but you're fixing to graduate. Y'all don't even know my hallelujah in that time. Because it went deep. It went really deep because it meant I don't have to go through situation after situation after situation anymore. Now I can go in position, and although it might hurt, and although I might face some adversity, although I may face some opposition, I'm still doing it from a place of position and not a place of situation. Amen? Okay, so the first thing to do is identify the false identity. So I identified the false identity, which was in ministry, okay? But I'm going to take you through the process of how he did that for me. Now, these might not be the areas where you were operating in, but I believe there are some of you in here that are operating in these areas that need to hear this, that need to hear this, amen? So he tells me, remember I told y'all one of the things he said is start working on your health. 
So right after this, the Lord tells me to join CrossFit. Now, if you don't know anything about working out, CrossFit's like the the hardest type of <laughs> my my shins are aching right now. Okay, I had to take some Advil before I came because my shins were. But CrossFit ain't no joke, y'all. So he tells me join CrossFit. I said, uh, no, 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 no. This cannot be the Lord. This is the devil himself. I'm not joining CrossFit. No way. I can't even run. I can't jump. I can't do a jumping jack. Nothing without running. No, I'm not. So I went and got me a membership at Planet Fitness, okay? $25 a month. I can do what I want. I don't have to deal with nobody telling me what to do, how to do it, nothing. So I go. I start working out. I start working out faithfully. I'm, I'm getting it in. I'm starting to eat better. I'm starting to do all the things, but I'm not getting results. I'm like. Okay, what's going on? So I start reaching out all these different places. Personal trainer here, person. Everything kept falling through. Fall, and God kept CrossFit, CrossFit, CrossFit. So I kept sending in a thing to them. You send in a little thing to get information, and then they're going to call you. And when they call me, I just not call them back. <laughs> I just wouldn't answer the phone. <laughs> so I eventually surrendered to the Lord. And I go to this CrossFit. And... I walk in, and the moment I walk in, I said, oh, my God, the Lord wanted me here. He wanted me here. It was everything that I needed. Like, But as soon as I walked in, I felt God's peace. I said, this is where I'm supposed to be. And I can't even tell you all that it has been everything that God has, that I have needed. So what it did was show me that I was bound up in rejection. I didn't want to go to CrossFit because I felt like I would fail. I felt like I would embarrass myself. I would have to be, because CrossFit is a group training, okay? So it's basically personal training amongst a group of people. So my thing was I was already dealing with insecurity, but then I go to this CrossFit. God wants me to go to this CrossFit, and... um. I fear being around people. I fear people seeing me fail. Okay, so he showed me I wouldn't get involved with things I should out of fear of rejection. And I would overdo in areas that I felt comfortable. So if I felt comfortable, I would overdo, thinking that I was earning brownie points, thinking that all my leaders were proud of me, all of that. And then areas where I felt like I would be rejected, I stayed away from. But it was the very area that I felt like I would be rejected that God wanted me to be, not only for me, but for the people there. Amen. Because sometimes when God puts us in position, it don't even have nothing to do with us. It's to do with the people there. Amen. And <laughs> I put in here, if he doesn't, if he isn't in our meal planning, <clears throat> you can insert here whatever. Okay, let, let me rewind. Does God care about the small things? He had given me a word to give somebody during this time of prepping, prepping for this sermon, and it included this scripture. Matthew 6, 26 says, Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? God cares about something as simple as our workout routine. He really does, y'all. So I said, if he isn't in our meal planning and you insert here whatever it is that you need God to move in an area or that you're unsure that he cares about, it's not his lack of willingness. It's our lack of invitation. Because God will come into every single area of your life, your parenting, your workout, your meal plan, your job how you spend your money, like he will literally come in every single area of your life. So then he tells me, start intermittent fasting. Now, I had done intermittent fasting before, okay, but I had done it more for, like, losing weight. So I said, okay, <clears throat> I'll start doing intermittent fasting. Well, through this process, what he showed me was because I found comfort in going home to my snacks, y'all. For reals. 
when I got tired of being around people, I said, look, I would just, I didn't, I didn't even need to go do ministry anymore. I'm just going to go home to my snacks. I am so serious. And I would go home in the evenings. Like, I could go all day eating healthy and fine. But in the evenings, I would just be, I mean, London snacks were disappearing, all the things, okay? <laughs> so he showed me through this intermittent fasting that I was in a place of isolation and calling it protection. Ephesians 2.19, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. We were meant to be around one another. In fact, we were meant to need one another. So if you're in a place of isolation and calling it protection, I challenge you to evaluate, even if you're in a place where you believe you're in protection, I challenge you to evaluate to see if it's actually protection or if it's isolation. So the third thing he said was to start therapy. I said, what? I never, I never did a therapist before. I'd only been in therapist in my younger years. I had never done good with therapists before, so I said, Man, you know, man, I don't really need therapists. You're, you know, I got the Holy Ghost, like, and s- so much that he, he, I said, God, if this is you telling me that I need therapy, he confirmed it through a leader of mine. I said, if this is you, then make a way. When I tell y'all, a woman called me, okay, if, if y'all have ever done therapy, therapy is expensive. It's because it's worth it, but it's expensive, okay? I don't have insurance, so I don't have a way to have it paid for, okay? So <coughs> a woman calls me. She's a certain level of a therapist, and she wants to increase her, therapi- uh, her therapy. And so she needed some intern hours, and she said, I want to have you as my intern, so I'm going to give you eight months of free therapy. I said, my God. So that was the Lord, right? So through the therapy, though, okay, here we are, practical things, he starts to begin to show me things that I had unforgiveness. And <coughs> um, Matthew 6, 14, 15 is where I'm going to go. For y- if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive other their, for others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. So here I was, okay, I'm a new person, I'm lost in my identity, I'm thinking I'm forgiving, right? I have vision, right, like Pastor Jamel said, our feet are here, but we're over here, we're looking this way, Right? My feet wanted to go in the direction that God wanted me to go, but I had blurry vision. My vision was distorted. My vision was distorted. So I see through this that I was unable to forgive today because I was seeing through a lens many years ago. I still had a lens on from many years ago that was distorting my vision. I needed to forgive others, but I also needed to know that I was forgiven. And what it took was me forgiving other people to know that God forgave me and for me to also forgive me. And I couldn't learn this until I went to therapy, y'all. That's for me. I had to go to therapy to learn this. Okay, so the second thing is take your thoughts captive. Romans 12, 21, Paul urges us to take every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You are responsible for your thoughts. Cain's thoughts led to murder. Cain's thoughts led to murder. So through this little CrossFit ordeal, I start out my first couple of days. I'm like, I love it. I'm even telling Pastor Brown, I'm like, you should come and start, Pastor Brown, and it's great. I love it. We're doing weightlifting. I'm like, this is my jam. So I go, and they say, oh, now today we're going to run. <laughs> run? <laughs> Who? <laughs> what? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> right? I said, okay. 
I'm going to run. So I start running. I'm just a few meters in, y'all. I'm like, whoo, I cannot breathe. I got all these, like, major CrossFit, like, trainers, I mean, uh, athletes running. They're just doing it like it's nothing. I'm literally, like, seeing stars. I'm about to pass out. I'm like, oh, my goodness, okay? Listen, so, but what I began to do is I put my, my head down, and I watched each foot go in front of me. And I said, God, right now I don't feel like I can run. I don't feel like I can do this. But I know through you I can do this. I know you can give me supernatural strength to run. I said, so, God, I just speak to my mind right now. I can do this. I can run this race. I can do it and not give up. And, y'all, my body was screaming, like, screaming. I felt like I was going to pass out, but my mind was going. I'm like, yeah, I got this because I had my mind right. I spoke to my mind. Your mind must match your actions. We transform by the renewing of our minds, not our feet, not our actions. We can change the behavior all day, but if we don't change the mind, it ain't no good. That's where I was at when I was ministry focused. All the actions were right. I was doing all the right actions. I was praying for people. People were getting delivered. I was preaching the word, all of the things. But I was going home, and my mind was a mess. My mind kept saying, you'll always be an addict. My mind kept saying, you'll never amount to anything. My mind kept saying all of these things that God did not say about me, and I was tormented. I was tormented. I had to change my mind First, my actions weren't giving me freedom. My actions weren't making me live a life of abundancy, right? So, oh, and sometimes, y'all, we have to apply it consistently. I still am not running right there, okay? I'm still not, but I just keep on doing that. I got this. I got this. And before I know it, that run is over, and I, it's because I, I, it's gave me, it's shown me so much of the power of our mind. Okay, and the next thing, we're on number three, right? Make God's truth your truth. You have to make God's truth your truth. And the only way to do this is to read the word. Is to read the word. You know, only 30% of Christians will read the entire Bible. That broke my heart, but this broke my heart even more. Only 82% of American Christians read their Bible on Sundays only while at church. 82%. That means 18% of Christians are reading their Bible outside of Sunday church. You're never going to find your proper identity if you don't get in the word. I know that is bold because we see a lot come forth in this house. We see a lot come forth in this house. But you are never going to fully understand your identity if you do not get in the word. And I am saying this from somebody that tried to find my identity in everything but the word. And it wasn't until I got in the word that I found, started to begin who I was in the Lord. Whew, Jesus. So I'm going to give y'all an example. I was going to use a chair, but... I said, I'm wearing a dress. I'm just going to use this stool. But I'm going to take off my feet. I mean, my shoe. I'm going to take off my feet. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> I want my feet. <laughs> okay. So we all know, I think even the children know what gravity is in here, right? So I'm going to speak to gravity right now. Okay. Gravity, I believe that when I jump off this stool, I'm going to fly. I believe when I jump off this stool, I'm going to fly. Gravity did not give a dang what I believed. (laughs) I did not fly when I jumped off that stool, right? And it's the same way with Satan. He does not care what you believe. 
we have to conquer him with the truth. When he gets, when you get delivered from one lie, he's going to come at you with another lie. Okay? When you get delivered from the next lie, he's going to come at you with another lie. He's going to keep on working against you the same way, even when you believe the lie that he ain't working. Because sometimes people believe that lie, that he ain't working. He's going to come at you with another lie. He don't care. You have to conquer him with the truth. When he tempted Jesus, what did Jesus speak back to him? The word of God. He spoke truth back to him. He is the father of lies. For every lie, we must have a truth. So when I step up on this stool, I can tell gravity I'm going to fly. Gravity don't care. But when I tell this stool, listen, I mean, when I tell gravity, listen, I'm going to jump off this stool. It would have been better if I could have used a chair because the stool's not hard to jump off. But y'all get the idea, right? So when I, when, if I tell gravity, listen, I'm going to jump off this stool, and I'm not going to be able to fly. But what I am going to be able to do is land on my feet. All right? It's the same way when we tell when the devil comes to us and we come back with him, no, I'm a child of God. No, I am a light. I am chosen. I am beloved. Right? I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm forgiven. I'm valuable. When we can come back at him with those things and shut him down. Amen. The greatest way to learn both your identity and God is to get to know God because we were created in his image, right? So getting to know God teaches us who we are too, amen? So during this time, God tells me, he gives me a crazy challenge to read the word in a really short amount of time. I said, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I don't know. This is crazy. I'm already doing this. I'm already doing where am I going to fit it in? The, 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 I give him all these. Reasons. I said, okay, God, I'm going to do it because you have allowed me. You have shown me as I trust you through all these other things you told me to do. Things are coming to pass, right? So I start to do it. And what it does to me, y'all, is it starts to wash me. Like I wasn't. And that's even when I had told my spiritual mother that I'm going to do this challenge to the Lord. She said, but. I'm just wondering how you're going to study the word. I said, God says not to make that my focus. He said, just read it. I said, okay, because studying is important, right? But he said, just read it. He wanted me to read this whole Bible in 90 days. I thought it was impossible. I said, how? But, y'all, it started washing me. It really started. It started I started thinking, oh, I really wasn't that big of a mess. There's a lot more messy people in the word, okay? I'm serious. There's a lot more. And then what, listen, then what it did is it started to show me that reading the word didn't have to be a checklist. It didn't have to be, God just began to speak to me in so many different ways to where, y'all, I was literally getting up in the middle of the night wanting to read the word. I'm like, what is happening? I always had to be super disciplined before in order to read the word, okay? So, and I always say this, I tell the youth this all the time. When I grow up, I want to know the word like Pastor Jamil. (laughs) Right? Yes, he sure does. And I be saying that. When I grow up, I want to know the word like him. So, but I asked him, I said, now, Pastor Jamil, does it take discipline for you to know the word like you know it? He said, yeah, it takes discipline. And he shared with me a gift that he has on how he receives revelation of the word. But he said, it still takes me being disciplined. And then he said, not only does it take discipline, but it's a lifestyle. He don't treat the word like it's something he can do. He treats the word like it's something he has to do. Just like we get up and brush our teeth in the morning. Just like we get up and shower in the morning. We get dressed. We don't walk out of our house without getting dressed. So why do we walk out of the house without reading the word? 
Pastor Jamel has made it his lifestyle. He doesn't just know the word because he just sits around and looks at the Bible. He knows the word because he's made it part of his life. He's disciplined himself to read the word regularly. Amen? And, not, and the, the word increases your faith. It doesn't just teach you your, that your identity. It increases your faith. It roots you in truth, and it provides encouragement. Y'all, I have never had any better encouragement than that of what's in the word, both to break off strongholds and lies that I believed and also to encourage me in where I currently am and who I am. Amen? Okay, the next thing is get vulnerable. And I also put in this, get vulnerable, be willing to submit to leaders. Woo-wee. I'm going to say that again. Get vulnerable and be willing to submit to leaders. Vulnerability isn't just exposing us. It's also being willing to let them expose us. So, Pastor Chris, can I use your glasses real quick? Woo wee. <laughs> Woo wee. I can't even barely see. I don't think I can even see my notes. Either I'm blind or he's blind. One of the two. <laughs> One of the two. Sometimes, though, you have to borrow the lens of someone else to hear what God is saying. And that's why it's important to be submitted to our leaders. I got to give them back to you because I really can't see with them. But we're going to act like I still have his lens on, okay? When I was in this situation that I was in, Pastor Brandon calls me, and he says, Natalia, Bishop is requesting to meet with you. I said, oh. <laughs> okay, when? He said, tomorrow. I said, tomorrow. Okay, no problem. I'll make it work. Let me know what time and where. But on the inside, I'm like, is he kicking me out of the church? What is happening? What is going on? Why, why is he meeting with me? Why didn't he just say something Sunday? Why didn't he just ask me Sunday what he needed to ask me? Why are we sitting down? So he tells me he wants to meet at a restaurant. I'm like, okay, great. Lovely. So I show up, and the first thing Bishop says to me, Brandon will testify to this. He says, I don't usually do this. I said, okay, great. <laughs> he said, I usually let Brandon handle this, but I felt like this was a 911 and that I needed to get involved in this. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so he starts bringing up the situation, and I'm talking, I'm telling him, you know, because I remember I'm at the place where I asked God to get me out of the situation, but then once he did, I'm like, wait, 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 wait. Maybe I should admit that was the devil. The devil's trying to get me out. Okay, so I'm telling him how I'm praying, I'm believing, blah, blah, blah. And he stops me. He said, do you want to hear what I have to say? I said, sure. He said, I would not only walk away from that situation, but I would run. He said, run, didn't he, Pastor Brandon? He said, I would run from that situation. I said, okay, I'm going to take what you say, but I'm going to pray a little bit more through it. I'm going to pray a little bit more through it. <laughs> I'm going to pray a little bit more through it, and then I'll get back. He was like, oh. Okay, so he let me go. Okay, and uh, but what I needed, when I went home that night, I said, God, was he right? Was I started praying. God started telling me he was right. Trust him. Trust him. That's why I have you sitting under him. Trust him him. And y'all, it did not feel good. It did not feel good. Vulnerability is remarkably painful. Removing carefully constructed masks require courage, courage and authenticity with others. We have to be willing to be seen and known. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Right? Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls, and they are accountable to God. Our leaders ain't 
out here playing no funky business because they know they got to report to God. So if your leaders are telling you something, you might want to take it serious because it's them that's on the line when they're telling you to do something. Amen? Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. So I ask you this. I was not, I was not going to go down this road. The Lord told me earlier today to go down this road. I said, I'm not going to go down. He said, go down this road. I said, okay. He's telling me again, go down this road. So I'm going to go down this road while we're on submission. I ask you this. Some of you may be submitted to leadership. But are you, doing, are you giving them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow? <clears throat> Submission is not selective. You don't get to pick and choose which leaders that you submit to in the house of God. I don't get to say, okay, I'm going to submit to Pastor John, but I don't like Pastor Brittany. So I'm not going to submit to her. And I'm using Pastor Brittany not because she's unliked, but because I know she's mature enough not to get offended. Okay, so if I choose that I don't like Pastor Brittany, that's okay. It's even okay with her. She don't really mind if you like her or if you don't like her. Am I right? It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> but you still got to submit to her if you're going to submit to Pastor John and Bishop and Pastor Jamel. And okay? And let's, let's take it outside. Let's take it outside of the pastors because some people are okay to submit to the pastors, but they're not okay to submit to Pastor Chris because he's only 30 years old. So they look at him like a son instead of a leader. So they're not going to do what Pastor Chris says. Again, another person I know is mature enough not to get offended, so I'm using for an example. Okay? Right? But I'm not going to submit to Pastor Chris because he's only 30 years old. I actually had somebody tell me that. I'm not going to submit to this person, or I'm not going to submit to that person. Sir, ma'am, in the house of God, if you want to honor God, you are going to. If you want to dishonor God, then do what you want to do, right? But <clears throat> proper biblical submission, amen, some of y'all are exhausting leaders because you refuse to submit to those that God has put in authority over you. Sometimes we'll call Bishop for prayer. And I, hear me, I'm not saying don't call. I, listen, I have called Pastor Chris at 9 o'clock on a Saturday morning and just screamed and yelled and cried and all the things. I'm not saying don't call them. Hear me when I say I've called Pastor Brandon over some foolishness. And he'll just sit there. You're right. It's okay. Let it out. Okay, so I'm not saying don't call them, but we call in Bishop asking him for prayer, and we have intercessors that can pray a demon from Tulsa to Kansas City in half a second. But we refuse to call the intercessor and ask for prayer because for some reason we don't want to be submitted to those in authority. Submission is not selective. Amen. When I first got saved, <clears throat> I used to be on meth, so I was really scared of cameras. I didn't like cameras at all. Okay, right. <laughs> if you've ever, ever done meth, even just one time, you probably have a, a filter about cameras, okay? But <clears throat> so the Lord tells me, I did not believe that God knew everything. I was really ignorant to, to this, okay? I was really ignorant to God, to the word, all of the things. So I really did not think <clears throat> that God knew everything. I thought he only knew what I showed him or told him. <laughs> so I started hearing people preach and, you know, God's in the unseen, the seen, the, you know, he knows everything. I'm like, he does? I'm so serious. I know it sounds really dumb, y'all, but I did not know that. So God told me, he said, 
I want you to see me like a camera. I was like, oh, I'm out of here. <laughs> so curious. He said, I, I'm with you at all times. I see everything, every little detail. I said, okay, yeah, you really did. I got a greater understanding of God, but what that did is it caused me to want to submit to him. It caused me to want to submit to him, but I was in a place where I would not submit properly to my leaders. And that's when, when God put me, sent me to serve Pastor Regina is when I started to learn submission, proper submission. He moved me from a mega church into her church is a smaller congregation. And he said, <clears throat> I want you to go there and I want you to serve her and I want you to serve her well. I said, okay, I don't really know what that means, but I'll go, you know. Uh, okay, I did not say it like that. I was like. Let me try it out. I went and visited. I had already visited there because I knew their family. I said, this small church, you're going to take me out of a mega church, right? Because I remember I'm ministry focused. So I said, you're going to take me out of a big church where I feel like I'm being used. I feel like I'm, you know, learning some things. All, and you're going to put me in this small little tiny church to serve this lady I don't even know. So I went to her. I said, I know this might sound really weird. <laughs> But I feel like the Lord is telling me I need to come here, that I need to leave this church that I'm in and come here. And she said, okay, I think you are. Okay, so really long story short, I end up going um, to her church, and that's where I began to uh, learn submission. God tells me, I think I'm going there. I think I'm going to be doing all the same thing. I'm going to be starting to lead B groups, you know, all the, it belong, anyway, small groups, all these things. And God says, I want you to vacuum the sanctuary. I said, what? <laughs> what? Vacuum. He said, I want you to clean the bathrooms. I want you to restock the shelves. I want you to go get the paper towels. I want you to serve at the food ministry. He started telling me all these things that he wanted me to do. And I would do things for her, like get her water. I would encourage her. Simple things, what I thought were simple things, God had to lead me into doing it. But she was like, man, I have never had anybody honor me like this. I've never, I've never seen, you know, you just do things unto the Lord. I said, wow, what it meant to her. What it meant to her. I said, God, this is what you desire for your leaders. And I didn't do it perfect. I did not do it perfect. Hear me. I did not submit to her perfect because I ended up in a situation, right? And she told me not to get in the situation. I got in the situation. So I wasn't fully submitted to her because if I was, I would have never gotten to that situation. But that's where I started to learn the base of submission and honor, okay? And now I have continued to grow in that, still making mistakes. There, Like I said, when I first came here, it was really hard for me to understand why I was here. I felt like an outcast. I, felt, I expressed it even one night on a Tuesday night. I felt just in the wrong place, but I knew it's where God had me to be. But it wasn't an issue with all of y'all. It was an issue with me. It was an issue with me. Can you imagine that? Whew. Last thing, and then I'm going to let y'all go. Lean on his grace. 2 Corinthians 12. We're going to go to verse 9 and 10. I'm sure I'm giving you the NMD version. That's the Natalia Michael Berry version. <laughs> You're like, oh. <laughs> my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Grace is God's unmerited favor. If you didn't know that, you learned that in Preach, Preacher, Preach. The teens, Preach, Preacher, Preach. <laughs> but it is so much more than that. This scripture, when I tell y'all, because I stand before you and tell you all the things that God did for me in the year that I had been going through this, but the part that a lot of people didn't see is my weakness. Some did because I would call them. When I tell y'all Pastor Brennan and Miracle were people that were there for me. Whew, y'all. 
not only would I not still be in the church if it was not for that couple, but I do not think I would still be alive if it was not for that couple. I could say that honest to God. Um, because they were there for me through some really ugly things. And when every time I would be vulnerable with them and they would just keep coming back loving me even more, Loving me even more, y'all. They didn't talk about me. They didn't gossip about me. They didn't tell people my business. That wasn't anything I'd ever had before. I was so used to when I would tell people my business, they would tell other people. But the reason why is because when I heard people's business, I would tell other people. Amen? So it was around the kind of people that I was. But God began to show me something different because he wanted to take me somewhere different. So through my weakness is where God's strength showed up. Grace is what saved us. It's the essence of the gospel. It gives us victory over sin. There's so much that grace does for us. Sometimes what we want to do is we want to be delivered from the weakness. When I was first going through the coming out of this situation, I thought, I'm just, I, if y'all remember, Pastor uh, Brandon even preached on a Job season. Right about this time that had, I said, oh, well, I must be a prophet of the Lord because I already went through the Job season, so I'm ahead of the game. I'm so serious, y'all. I really thought that. So I was like, no problem. This is going to be, and I was just entering the Job season. woo and I wanted so bad to be delivered from that weakness. I wanted so bad to be delivered from that weakness. But God wanted so bad to show me his power in that weakness. So he allowed me to stay weak for a little bit, y'all, so that he could show up and show his power in my life. If I wouldn't have allowed, if I wouldn't have surrendered to the weakness and allowed God to move with grace, I would have repeated the cycle. Now I can stand before you and say I've broken the cycle. I've broken the cycle of getting in situation after situation of rejection and isolation. And, right? and I've learned a thing or two through the process. So I challenge you, if you're having trouble with who you are, if you're having torment in your mind about who you are in God, go through these things. Allow God to take you through these things and deliver you because he desires for you to know who you are in him. Amen? And I didn't use a reader tonight because instead I'm using our professional Q&A specialist. Pastor John. <laughs> so, questions, concerns, rebukes, direct to our very own Pastor John. Amen? That's my substitute for not using a reader tonight. <laughs> I told him, I said, Pastor John, are you going to be here when I preach on Tuesday? He said, yeah, I am. I said, okay, because if Bishop beats me up, I'm going to hand the mic to you. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Y'all, I know it's for good. I know it's for growth. Um, with that being said, that's all I have. Will y'all clap your hands for her? So good. So good. Did anybody get anything? Did anybody take notes? This was refreshing. She said she got saved in 27. Now, sometimes it's good to hear a 50-year-old been serving Jesus for 50 years but I sometimes like them fresh testimonies. Let everybody know who still got a little struggle going on. That he's, he's still yet a healer. He's still yet a deliverer. So we thank God for the seasoned saints. But sometimes we need to hear somebody that still got little ruffles. So that you can know that he can still do it. Say amen for our dancers. Give, and give God praise for the amen. Amen for the dancers. Um. Those of you who serve in, in intercessory capacity in the ministry, raise your hand. I know we'd have some fall off and get fired and 
We, we thank God for the faith. Come on, put those hands up. If you're praying on Tuesday morning, you can lift those hands tonight. All right. Thursday, I'm charging you with the same challenge that I gave our executive leaders. You are too fast. Thursday, Friday, up until we meet for this um, breakthrough night, okay? So you don't just get to be an intercessor by prayer, but you have to follow formation. Amen. And so we're going to fast. Those of you who are leaders, you are to fast Thursday up until the, um, uh, I keep wanting to call this church service, breakthrough night. If this is your first time, no, we don't push a lot of fasting around here. We believe in eating. Glory to God. But we're going to fast. And so if that's your phone, if you've never fasted before, one time I tried to fast for the first time, I did three days and didn't eat no meat and was right here getting lightheaded, Miss Linda. Brittany said, you have to eat protein. I said, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling woozy. She said, eat some beans. You just, I just tried to, go <laughs> I tried to go cold turkey. So if you take medicine, I'm going to let you determine, you and the Holy Ghost, how you fast, but you need to give up something. That is second nature to you. You sweet heads in the room. Got to have something sweet every time. Now, listen, if you commit that I'm going to consecrate, I'm going to fast to discipline my flesh, someone's going to bring donuts to work on Thursday. Someone's going to barbecue for you if you fast. So I'm telling you, but listen, this is how you know it is of the Lord, and the enemy does not want you to discipline yourself because whatever you're trying. She said she was delivered from meth, and it was meth on the flow. That's how the devil would do. So when you make your mind up, I'm not going to do this, or I'm going to pray from 12 midnight, fast from 12 midnight to 12 noon, there will be food. There will be emergencies. So if you have a prayer closet, Tell your kids, hey, from this time to this time, if it's not a fire, don't bother me. Just set it up. Put your phone on. Do not disturb. But everybody say, consecrate yourself. We're not doing it to make God do anything that has not already been on his agenda. We fast to discipline our flesh. We fast to become sensitive to the spirit so that when we pray, there's not a whole lot of garbage and junk that we have to move through. Some people are going to get delivered Saturday night. Can you say yes? And so we expect healing. And so I want you intercessors, eat a mint, brush your teeth before you come to church Saturday night. And so if you pray for somebody, you have fresh breath. I'm serious. I'm serious. When I come to church, I put a mint in my mouth just in case the Lord want to breathe on somebody. I don't want them to miss God. So what I'm saying is come prepared. Last thing. Um, they said Lil Wayne came to, to Tulsa Thursday night. I'm going to ask you if you went or not. But the concert started at 8, but Wayne didn't get on the stage until about 10.15. That's what they told me. But they waited. Them folks paid that money, parked downtown, and waited, and then went to work the next morning and popped a B12 and took A lady told me. She said, I'm struggling. She said, but I went to see him, his ugly self. But we will do we will do what it is that we deem it that is important. Wayne didn't give him no joy. Wayne gave, Wayne gave him a good time and some pictures. So we could do much more for that for the um, King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. All right. So I just wanted to address you, make sure that we know what the mission is, healing, deliverance, and prophecy. That is what we're believing God to do Saturday night. All right. So we're going to be on point. Make sure you come early or come on time. No one's important, okay? You're important to the Lord, but don't, don't come in here fashionably late. Come comfortable. Put some deodorant on. We are going to do whatever the Lord wants us to do. I just want us to be ready, but I'm excited, okay? Get an offering in your hand. Get an offering, in, and then we're going to pray before we leave. Natalia, we love you. Thank you so much. I love a transparent preacher. We thank you for speaking to our hearts and our identity in you. Father, we thank you tonight that you would give these people a determination to consecrate themselves. We thank you, Spirit of God, that you would give us the faith to discipline our flesh. 
Holy Spirit, we want to see you move in a very tangible way this Saturday. And so we thank you for those that are coming. We thank you for those that will be watching. And we thank you in advance that all that will be done and said and demonstrated in this room Saturday, you would get the glory. Let the kingdom of heaven be made manifest among us. Now, Father, I thank you for every seed sower, every giver, every tither, every person who had it to give tonight. I'm asking you to bless their hand, bless their wallets, bless their bank accounts, cause them to run over and to have more than enough. In Jesus' name we pray. Say amen. Thank you.